Hi, my name is Rich Bowen and I'm with the Open Source Program Office at Red Hat. One of the cool things about working at Red Hat is the depth of open source experience I encounter in my colleagues on a daily basis. This conversation is with Scott Stark, who has been with Red Hat for 19 years and came in with the JBoss acquisition. And he talks a little bit about how he got started in open source software to begin with back in the 90s before the World Wide Web and before open source as we know it today. So you've been you've been with Red Hat a little while now, right? Yeah, coming up this year should be 19 years, you know, wow. including including the time with JBoss because I came in through the JBoss wow. acquisition. But tell tell me about how you got started doing this whole free software thing. So I I started out in chemical engineering and I liked computers all through undergrad, but really, you know, they were just a tool at that point. Um, when I got into grad school, I started out in a field that was at the time supposed to be really interesting. Uh, at the time, this is when the new low temperature, quote unquote, low, temp low temperature superconductors were coming out, which meant mm -hmm. like liquid nitrogen temperatures. And so that's, that's the profession I got involved with was studying one of those materials that was, you know, supposed to be interesting for that that um, that arena. But what it ended up being was just basically, you know, data acquisition and looking at very fundamental physical properties, and that was super boring. But doing <laughs> that, I um, I was doing the programming on the data acquisition software, and I go, you know what? I think I want to switch over to start doing computers. So I was taking some computer science courses and. I was actually thinking about leaving and going and get a, a degree in computer science there. Uh, this is at the University of Delaware, which is kind of in the backyard of DuPont, which is why it's a big uh, chemical okay. engineering school. Um, but somehow, uh, the, one of the professors in the material science department had gotten a grant for, at the time, a supercomputer, just like a 32-node uh, BVN TC2000, he had no idea what to do with it, and he knew I was into computers, and so I go, ah, heck yeah, I can figure that out, no, no biggie. So I got into that, and that's where I really got into uh, programming, both at the assembly and C and C++ level. And it, at the same time, it also happened to be when Next was coming out, uh -huh. and they just come out with their Next workstation, and I thought that was a, it's like the coolest machine I'd ever seen. and so. Somehow I got one of those as well. And so that's when I really started programming on the side for fun. And I, that's when I started looking at open source. And because I was looking at, well, you know, how do you how do you program this thing and uh, what, what's available? And at that time, there was no web in terms of right. like HTTP. Yeah. But what was out there was uh, FTP servers. So that's where you, you went and searched FTP servers. And there was a... Uh, a protocol and offering from McGill University in Canada called Archie and Gopher, yeah. which was trying to be the you know the the web interface, well the the network interface to these these servers. So it, the current software was bad for that. So I, I ended up writing a next version of a kind of a, what you would see on the next uh, file browser or today the you know the Linux file browsers that was for these servers. So. That was my first offering in, into open source. I made that available, but I immediately now, got in in those. Just to interrupt briefly, yeah. when you say you made it available, what did that mean then? Then it, it meant putting it up on you know an FTP server. Right. So this is this is pre any of the various uh, software forage sites. Yeah, for sure. Out these days, so for sure, yeah. a little harder to discover stuff at that point. Yeah, and it's funny because I, I, when you mentioned when you talk, when you contacted me, I actually went out and looked. Does that even exist? And <laughs> there's there's no trace of it other than for some reason it was mentioned in an RFC about the state of searching oh, the web. Okay. <laughs> somehow that somehow that made it in there, but the software itself I can't find. I have no idea if yeah. somebody has it. But <laughs> but the other thing is, so I called it Next Archie at the time. And so the first thing that happened was Next contacted me and told that I was in, in violation of my <laughs> of, of their trademark. So I had to rename it. <laughs> so, 
that, you know, that's the common bane of open source developers is, you know, yeah. running a foul of naming conventions. So that was the first thing I'd done. And, you know, I just, I just kept trying to do different software development projects on the side. And, you know, I even would, would my initial efforts just to try and get stuff on my resume, would I, I would offer to do stuff for free. And so people mm -hmm. would contact me. You know, go like, are you are you serious, or is this just like bait and switch? And I go, no, no, I'll, you know, I'll do it because, it's, you know, I'm just trying to to build up my resume. So, like the first thing I did in that arena was a um, a true type file or font browser on the next because I guess that was relatively new and kind of proprietary in terms of uh, mm -hmm. you know being able to see what the makeup of the font was, and so that was something I'd, I'd done as well just to get into it. But then, you know, it was it's it was a a long path after that before I really got fully into open source, which ultimately happened through uh, starting on JBoss, uh, like right at right at the time around, I think it was right after Mark had just kind of n had the, the company not really go forward um, as a, a commercial offering and he just had opened it up. And mm -hmm. so there was just, Ultimately, at that time, we got started. It was just Mark, his wife, and I who started training around JBoss because I looked at JBoss because I needed an application server and WebLogic and WebSphere were you know, ridiculously prohibitive for you know the startup I was trying yeah. to to do. So that that's how I really got into it full time. Are you still working on that now? Well, I don't work on the application server itself, but I'm still involved with, for example, the. The now Jakarta E specifications, yeah. um, but I don't work on, for example, Wildfly anymore. What do you do these days to to keep it fun? Well, I'm I'm looking at all the various technologies that kind of dovetail into the mm -hmm. middleware space. Um, I like looking at the the little IoT type devices like the Raspberry yeah. Pi and Arduino and and those type of things, and, and you know, because I have some interest in um my own personal projects for stuff i need around the house mm -hmm. um the 3d printing i'm kind of getting interested in, in the cnc printing world and the, the open source versions of that stuff because i really don't want to you know spend a bunch of money on a, a commercial cnc printer so just you know stuff like that i mean there's a million other things the artificial intelligence is interesting but you know i don't quite know how to to make use of it for the stuff I'm interested in. So I just kind of keep playing with it. I just keep looking at various different projects in the spaces I'm interested in. Blockchain is another one, which I find interesting and yet very confusing and kind of a nightmare for users. So I'm wondering at, at some point, you know, how that space it becomes a little more safe and trusted. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, just, just stuff like that. And, you know, I'll, I think we're kind of going to transition maybe out of the Jakarta EE space. So I'll be looking to move, you know, back into one of our other middleware stacks, Quarkus, or you know, maybe you know, open shift side for Java in the future. So what would you say is, is the, one of the most interesting trends that you've seen over the last 20, 25 years in the open source space? Obviously the ubiquity of it and, and forges like GitHub and, you know, all the tooling around it that has made it so much easier to find, yeah. you know, open source stuff and, and manage it was, is the other big thing, you know, so all the, the integration with the CI infrastructures and the tooling, the tooling obviously has gotten much, much better. Um, you know, the IDEs and their ability to, you know, help with dealing with the frameworks. Cause I mean, uh, th that's the other thing that may or may not be interesting is, the explosion of languages, you know, that mm -hmm. that people have to deal with to produce, a, you know, a full stack application. And, you know, I don't see that slowing down at all. In fact, it seems to be accelerating when you add in on the, even on the Linux side, you're, you're introducing Rust. So, I mean, you know, that's yet another space I needed to try and get some, some feeling for. And, um, you know, Kotlin on the Java side, just uh, never ending. I mean, so I, I've never really like, JavaScript, but it's a necessary evil pretty much in the, in the web stack. So I've, I've been trying to learn TypeScript because that seems a little more palatable to me coming from the very strongly typed Java space. So, 
you know, that that's something else I keep keep trying to dabble into. And then the plethora of the the front end stacks, <laughs> I keep trying to figure out. You know, who is going to win that if ever battle? And doesn't seem like there's ever going to be a winner. Um, you know, whether it's React or Angular or you know, yeah, Google's latest thing, which is kind of interesting, that because it is cross platform and even on the desktop. So I think, you know, those are some of the interesting things. You know, what, what's interesting now, though, is the fact that um, open source is also being, on the one hand, criticized because of lack of support for, mm -hmm. you know, some critical infrastructure projects. And, you know, I saw that we were involved with that, that uh, White House discussion around yeah. that topic. And so I, th I think that's an interesting piece that, you know, Red Hat and JBoss certainly can be a part of to help, you know, make it will continue to help open source be um, an enterprise tool. But it brings up some interesting things too, because you, I've seen developers basically, you know, bomb their own projects because they don't feel like they're being appreciated. And that's kind of a mm -hmm. double edged sword that, you know, it, it, it gets into, um, you know, what's, what's the true purpose of open source? There's no one clear answer. You right. know, I mean, there really is, uh, well, from my perspective, especially how I started, I don't think you'd have an expectation that this is something that you're going to make a living out of. You know, I mean, it's going to have to be a pretty, pretty multifaceted approach and just be one thing that you're involved with. You know, I, I, I thought it was the one case that I definitely kind of struck me as strange was somebody doing something in a project that fundamentally was just kind of like colored coloring the console output in the right, JavaScript yeah. space. Yeah. You know, I'm like, you know, come on. I mean, this, okay. So a lot of people are using it, but it's not really a critical piece of, you know, software. So to take that, that point of view that, you know, you can basically create a Trojan horse or, I mean, you could even go far as so far as calling it ransomware. I mean, that's, that's just not the right, not, not the right way to deal with this. So if you could give yourself some advice back when you were in graduate school or possibly, you know, somebody who's in that position today, yeah. what, what advice would you give? Well, I mean, it, it's pretty straightforward and it's, it's what I followed is that you just have to get out there and, you know, learn, get, find a project that you're going to have, you know, some passion for and just start contributing. Like one of the things that's always a, shortcoming or necessity in a given project is documentation and that's also one of the ways to kind of learn it is you know if you can think about that you were going to have to teach this or you know uh, be, be write a book about it you mm -hmm. know what would you have to do you know how would you contribute to the project in terms of learning it and you know going through their existing documentation and, and uh, making it better um, as well as even you know tutorials around how do you how do you get into the project, et cetera? The, you know, those are some very obvious things that will get people's attention and, and get your foot in the door if, if that's what you're trying to do. You know, you don't necessarily have to go in and create the the most interesting Linux kernel patch in the history of <laughs> Linux kernels to get started. But, you know, that's a tall order because I know many good software de developers haven't even been able to do that <laughs> over time. So, you know, don't set the bar too high. There's lots of stuff to do. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and your insight. Great talking with you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.